Amen. So during this, um, after the outbreak, sometimes I feel like I need to re-explain some of the, the reason why we're going through the book of Acts. And I believe that the church is in a new season. I believe that God is calling his church to do things a little bit more differently. As a person who have been in the ministry for the last 17 years, but someone who's been saved the last 19 years, I would say that the church has been a place or organization or a living organization that has been focused inside the walls of the church. That we had our music and we have our titles and we have our events. But I believe that God is calling the church, especially in these last days, to step outside the walls of the church and begin to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who don't know. Now, I probably may seem more like an evangelist because it's really about, you hear me preach about reaching so many different people. But God also has me in the book of Acts. And as we study the book of Acts, as we go through the book of Acts, we will begin to see that God, the, the early church did some things a little differently than the way that we're doing things now. If you begin to look at the early church, you will begin to see that the way that they had church is different than the way we have church right now. Now, okay, they didn't have a building to go to. They didn't have the sound, they didn't have the TV, but they had a heart that was gonna worship God and because of that heart and because of that love that they had for God, they took that word. They took that relationship, they took that encounter, and they spread that word all over the world. And I believe that God is calling us today to say if we love Jesus, if we know the word of God, that there should be something that takes place in our life that we want to share the word of God everywhere we go. Now I'm not here to preach a message to you to just get you excited or, or, or even make you feel bad. But I'm telling you, we are living in a day where people need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and that God is sending us, amen? Kehende, if you can, could you hit the, the mute button on the keyboard? When we watch the news, there's individuals that have been crying out that they have been persecuted uh, because they are told to wear a mask. You ever see folks, they are angry, they are frustrated that somebody is telling them, put on your mask. That's the people, huh? And they think that that's persecution. And today as we read in the book of Acts, chapter eight, we're gonna see what true persecution looks like. Because persecution is not somebody telling you to put on a mask to keep other people safe. But persecution in the book of Acts, we're going to begin to see how the early church was persecuted for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? The church today, and I've seen it, Moody Bible Institute, if they begin to teach a message or preach a message that a certain person or organization does not like, I've seen it in other churches as well, they will have people who would stand outside and protest and say, you guys are haters. You guys don't love people, you're hate mongers. And as the church folks, we may say, you know, the pastor may come up and be like, we're being persecuted for what we believe. I believe the early church today would say, if that's persecution, give it to me all day long. This week in the news, I don't know if you saw, but um, they shut down Mayor Lightfoot Street. Did, you, did you, anybody see that this week? They have about 50 police officers on her street to make sure that no one protests in front of her house. Mayor Lightfoot may be saying that she's also being persecuted for being the mayor and for all the things that's going on. But I believe that if the early church was here, they would say, if you call that persecution, give it to me all day long. Give, give me that all day long. If that's what you call persecution, I'll take that all day. I'll, I'll lose some sleep if that's what you call persecution. 
If I got to be afraid that people are making threats to me and not really doing anything, give me that all day long. But the early church, as we have read in the book of Acts, these folks was just sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that these folks was thrown in jail. These folks was beat violently. And some of those folks who shared the gospel of Jesus Christ was also martyred for their faith. But what I believe is this, that sometimes when we go through persecution, we become so discouraged. We become afraid. Sometimes we don't even take our walk to the next step in God because we're afraid what's going to take place. But I believe this about persecution, that what the enemy meant for evil, God is able to turn it to good. And this is what I believe, if the people of God would truly get this in our hearts, instead of becoming discouraged when bad things happen in our life, and listen, it rains on the just and the unjust. Listen, I had the coronavirus. People, people, you know, people whispering to me, be like, hey, hey, Pastor Moody, is it true? Is it true? And I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, did you have it? I don't know what you're talking about. Did I have what? <laughs> Did you have the virus? And I'm like, oh yeah, I had the virus. Man, I put it all over Facebook. I sent everybody in the church a message that I had a virus. Listen, what the enemy meant for evil, God is able to turn for good. The coronavirus wasn't something that I felt like God gave me because I did something wrong. Listen, the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. That persecution is going to come. The difference is when persecution comes is how are we going to respond? Am I going to be discouraged? I'm a believer in God. No bad things going to happen to me. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Things is going to happen to us. But the thing is, when things happen to us, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? And I've been looking at the book of Acts, and I've been reading the book of Acts, and I'm saying, these folks are doing something a little differently than what we're doing. They had a, such an encounter with Jesus, regardless of what happened in their life, regardless of the persecution, they were still able to preach the word. Oh, I'm just going to mind my business because they don't want to listen. These folks didn't care if people didn't want to listen because there was somebody who would listen. We got to get through this time by sharing the word regardless if we're persecuted or not. We all going to go through persecution. And what the enemy, we, Pastor Monica would call it, stinking thinking. And when we go through some things, we start to have these stinking thoughts of how things are always going to get better, worse. Things are never going to get better. We have these thoughts, we call it stinking thinking. But when, when I start having those thinking thoughts, those bad thoughts, the Holy Spirit reminds me, Charles, you can trust God. When these thoughts come into my mind, the Holy Spirit will come, because they're going to come, ain't nobody perfect. The thing is this, how long are you going to entertain those thoughts? How long are you going to allow those thoughts to keep rattling in your mind? How much sleep are you going to lose thinking about that thing instead of trusting God? I love it. There's, there's a song, it's old, it's called, Don't Pray and Worry. Don't, 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 don't pray and worry. If you're going to worry, why are you praying for John? You don't like that way that sounds? I'll, I'll come to the studio and record that for you. Don't act like that. But that song, Don't Pray and Worry. If you're going to worry, why are you praying? That we need to learn to trust God. Even through anything that we're going through, persecution, whatever we're going through, we need to trust God. Amen? Amen? In the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 1, it says this. And Saul approved of their killing him. On the day of great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Father, I thank you for this word. Lord God, I thank you for trials and tribulation. Father, I stand here today and I say I thank you for persecution. Because as we read your word, as we go through your word, Lord God, we're going to see that persecution does something to us. And it does something to your word and for your kingdom. So Lord, I pray today that we would grab hold of your word and trust you 
through all situations. I thank you, I praise you for all that you're gonna do in Jesus' name, amen. In Acts chapter eight one, he's speaking about Stephen, the man who was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who they selected. And when they selected him, he went out and was preaching the word and was martyred for his faith. But persecution has something that it, it does something to us. Like I said earlier, when people get persecuted, they become discouraged, fearful, and even sometimes hopeless. I believe that God is able to turn our persecution and lead us to our purpose. I hope, I hope you're listening to me. Persecution has a purpose. And that's to lead us right to the place where God wants us to be. Instead of running for persecution, we need to run to it. I believe that God is able to use our time of perfect, uh, persecution to change things, to affect things. John Lewis, who everybody commends. Martin Luther King, who everybody looks up. Rosa Parks, the Freedom Riders, all these people who we look up to as young people and say, I thank God for their life. These people were beat, spit on. One of the worst things that I think somebody could do to me is spit on me. Nobody has ever spit on me on purpose. So I don't know how I would respond. But when I watch those civil rights shows and movies and documentaries, and I watch these people march and people spit right in their face, punch their wives right in their face, I sit there and I say, gosh, how can they withstand such a thing? But they had a, 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 a bigger purpose. See, they had a purpose, and when you have a purpose, your purpose don't, will cause you not to act out of character. They had a purpose that even though they were spit on and, and beat on and some even murdered for their faith, they had a purpose that they didn't respond in the flesh. And these individuals were able to bring a limelight to the U.S. who was supposed to be this place of freedom, but that they oppress certain groups. This place that was supposed to be a place of freedom where you had the right to protest, that the police officers was um, releasing dogs to bite you and allowed mobs to come and burn your house down in your church. This place that was supposed to be a place of freedom was in the spotlight all over the world. And because these people was not afraid to run for persecution, things began to change in America. That laws began to be written down. Things were have been amended because these individuals was willing to not run away from persecution. I don't know if I said this up here, but I, I believe that today we have a generation that's afraid of persecution. Afraid of pain. I think somebody was telling me, I don't know if it, it may have been Grace, that said Americans' pain tolerance is so low. We have no tolerance for pain. Was it you, Grace? Because we make everything comfortable here in America. So when we think that we're being persecuted, we're ready to run the opposite direction. Oh, I didn't get three meals today, so. I'm being persecuted. There's people who don't get meals in a day. Sometimes they eat once a week. But in America, if we don't get a meal, we are being persecuted, amen? There's inequalities that happen in our country. This week, uh, I came home on a Tuesday and there was a car lit on fire right outside my house. The people in the house didn't even know the car was lit on fire, right, Rachel? No clue. So I called the police department and I asked the police department, can we get this car removed from our house? This is just a smoldering car right here on the side of it. My wife called 311, then they called 911, and 911 said, there's no report that there was a car set on fire by your house. So they said, let's call the fire department. This is my wife. So they call the fire department and the fire department says, there is, there was no report of a car lit on fire in front of your house. And then a cop told me, you know what happens sometimes? 
Sometimes they'll take a burning car off the expressway and they'll just put it on somebody's block. I said, would they have put this car in Hyde Park? Would they have taken this car and dropped this car off in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, 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 a community that has wealth in it? And one of the officers began to get angry with me and said, Mr. Pastor Moody, I hate when people say that. We treat everybody the same. I sent her the video of the car being lit on fire right here by my house. Somebody came and lit the car on fire and then ran. I, I got it on, I sent her the videotape. And then I sent her the videotape of the fire truck putting the car out that was on fire. And then guess what? There was a cop squad car right across the street from the firemen put in the car. I sent her all this information and I said, listen, all I'm saying is that there's something the wrong matter with our system. Mm -hmm. That you could treat the community that I live in differently than you would treat the community in High Park. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is, and her whole thing, I said, listen, I'm, I'm not, listen, I, I don't want to see nobody lose their job. I'm not here to get no reporters out here to say, look how they treat us. I said, I just have one request. She said, what's that? I just need y'all to do your job. Just do your job. My tax money pays for your job. Do your job. Don't treat me no different than the other people. See, but there's, there's a purpose when, when inequality and things happen, somebody has to begin to, to raise their voice so that change could happen. I believe this. I've been telling Chuck this. The church has done a lousy job of really bringing justice to the earth. We have done a lousy job because God has called us to be just. See, God didn't call the hospitals to take care of the sick. Jesus said, you take care of the sick. God didn't call food pantries to feed the hungry. He told the church, you feed the hungry. When Jesus, Jesus said when people were sick, it didn't say raise up chaplains or have nurses and doctors. It said when people were sick, go visit them in their houses. See, when we talk about justice, if justice is going to change anything, it's the church responsibility to do it, not the government. And if things is going to take, if things is going to change, it's going to have to happen with us. But the reason why the church don't stand up for injustice is because the church is afraid of persecution. And you know what the persecution, it ain't somebody coming to kill us, somebody removing our 501c status. Hey, Curtis, what happened when they take away the Work Foundation 501c3 status? You know what happened? Now those who donate can't even get a, a break on their taxes. So now we're afraid that people's not going to give their offering and donate anymore. So we make sure that we stay undercover and don't mess with the government because they have the power to mess with our bread. This is the persecution that the church is going through in America. See, are we allowing this persecution that we're going through, are we allowing it to, to cause us to be bitter? Are we growing bitter? As a church, we need to learn to embrace persecution. We have to remember that there's a God on the throne that's in control of everything. Like, do, 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 we, do we recognize that the God that we serve, the God that we sing about, the God that we talk about, do we recognize that this God is on the throne and he's able to change things just like that? He's able to change things just like that. We have to put our trust in God and keep on moving. The church didn't stop growing during this time of persecution. If you read in the book of Acts, it said that the word of God even spread even more. I said it earlier, but I have met people who won't surrender to God. I don't know if this ever happened to anybody, but the moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ, it seemed like all hell broke out. That happened to anybody? The moment you fully, like, I'm surrendering my life, things just like your money started acting crazy. The people in your life started acting crazy. And people was just like, man, 
If this is like we're serving God, I don't want no parts of it. You know what? I will say with my mouth, I will believe in him, but I will not surrender with my heart. I will not surrender with my life because there's a cost. And Jesus said, there is a cost of following him. There's a cost. And the church in America, sometimes we don't want to pay that cost. But Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 39. If you have that, put it up for me. Matthew 10, 39. Mm -hmm. Those who try to gain their own life will lose it. But those who lose their life for my sake will gain it. If we're willing to lose our life for Jesus, he tells us that we will gain a whole new life. Don't allow persecution. Don't allow trials and tribulation to stop you from the life that Christ has for you. Continue to move forward in him, amen? amen. During persecution, keep growing in the Lord. Keep sharing the word and keep uh, moving forward. And then in this chapter, I want you to know that God's gifts are not for sale. In this same chapter, you're gonna see that God's gifts are not for sale. During persecution, People try to make a profit off of these times. We sometimes see the televangelists selling water and saying that this water here will cure you of the coronavirus. Take three sips a day, gargle a little, drink it down, and you will be cured of the coronavirus. And then another one would come out and said, hey, if that water didn't work for you, I got this handkerchief for you. If you take this handkerchief and you lay it on the person, they will be healed. I'm here to tell you that God gifts are not for sale. God gifts are not for sale. Simon the sorcerer saw the apostles lay hands on the believers and the Bible said that they began to speak in tongues and they wanted to purchase the gift of God. See, God's gifts are not for sale. When God, gifts, when God gives us something, it's not something that you have to do to receive it. You can't pay for it. See, I believe in this. I believe in the five-fold ministry. Anybody ever heard of that? The five-fold ministry. The Bible says that the five-fold ministry is a gift to the local church. It says that these God has given them as a gift, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers, the pastors, the apostles. And they said that these individuals' gifts is to equip the church for the work of the church. It's to equip the saints for the church. But I have seen God gifted some men and women. And they have taken the gift of God and they began to sell it. They began to charge people for the gifts of God. Now, I, don't, I believe that folks are supposed to get paid. You know what I mean? If you go out and you do work, you should get paid. I'm not saying that. But when you start charging people for the gift that God has given you, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, John, am I lying? This is what artists charge to share their gift with people. I would love to come and share my gift, but it's gonna cost you about 20 grand. What kind of gift is that? <laughs> Keep your gift. But God has given us gifts. Paul describes some other gifts. He said this, there's a spirit, a message of wisdom. God gives another gift to another, a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another, the interpretations of tongues. And then it goes on to say in Romans 12, it says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is the giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. There's all different types of gifts in the Bible. And God has a gift for every single person in this room, every single person who's watching online. God has a gift for every single person. But guess what? It can't 
be purchased. It's not for sale. I believe that God is waiting for us to receive the gifts that he has for us. God has a gift for every single person, but the key word is this, receive the gift that God has for you. He didn't say go run to this church over there to try to get that gift. He didn't say run over to that conference to get that gift. God has a gift for it, but he is the giver of the gifts, and our job is to receive it. Seeking God for it. See, everyone, Paul said, everyone should not desire to prophesy. He said, why? Because it edifies, it builds up the body. One more thing about the gifts. You can't work for it. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough for God to get the gifts. I believe the only thing that you need to do to, be, to receive this gift is to be a worshiper of God. Will you worship for God? And if you're a worshiper of God, God will bless you with gifts because these are the gifts that he's going to use to bring him glory, not you. Say that one more time, Chuck. The gifts that God gives you is not to bring you glory. It's not to bring you glory. It's to bring glory to him. I'm gonna end with this, the global church. Sometimes I hear people say that Christianity is a white man's religion. Anybody ever hear that? Christianity is a white man's religion. That's not true. Now every culture, whether you're black, white, you're gonna put your own influence on the word of God, regardless of who you are. But in this chapter, the Bible says that there was an Ethiopian eunuch. Ethiopia is in Africa. God sent Philip over to him to share the word of God to the Ethiopian eunuch, and the eunuch accepted Christ. This word is a global word. It isn't to change the hearts of us who lives in America, but this word is to change everyone all over the world. Whether you're black, white, brown, this word is supposed to change your life. This word is global. The persecution of the church calls this word to be spread all over the world. I believe that persecution must come because it puts us on our knees. It causes us to trust in God. I'm praying that this will be one of the largest presidential turnouts. I pray. You know, I hope it's the, the largest pres presidential turnout. It has nothing to do with any party. It's about all the complaining I'm hearing, Chuck. That's what it's about for me. I don't like this party. I don't like that party. Well, you better get up and vote. America ain't gonna change it till we, hey, America hear our voice. You better get up and go vote. Don't complain to me if you ain't vote. I'm, I'm telling you, people complain to me. I'm like, hey, Lene, did you vote? Shh, don't say nothing to me because you ain't doing nothing about the change that you want to see. America has gone through a lot, but is it enough for people to go out and vote? To go get out of their house for a couple of minutes and go vote? And America will continue to struggle until people is willing to suffer for what they believe. But listen about suffering, suffering not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has, pour, has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit has been given to us. Keep your hope in the Lord. I promise you, he won't disappoint you. Start sharing the word of God now. I hope y'all listen to me. Kyla, start sharing the word of God now. Because if the church does not voluntarily start sharing the word, God will use persecution to cause us to spread the word. I don't know about you, but I don't like pain, John. But if the church of America do not start the word, God will use persecution. If you're going through something right now, if you're struggling, if you're going through any type of thing, I want you to know right now in the name of Jesus Christ that God is able to use that very thing 
to get you right to where he needs you to be. Whether you're being persecuted, whether you're lacking things, God is able to use that thing, but you have to put your trust in him and not in your circumstances. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace, Lord God. Lord, I thank you that through all things, Lord God, through the persecution, through the trials, through the tribulations, that we can put our trust in you. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, even when we go through persecution, instead of it causing us to run the opposite direction, that we would run towards you, Lord God. That your Holy Spirit would fill us to stand on to the truth of your word and to preach your truth with boldness, Lord God, and clarity. But Lord, I pray we won't just preach it. I pray that we would live it. That we would live it even through persecution. That we would do the things that you have called us to do. So Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now. Strengthen them, encourage them to believe in you, to trust in you. That you would use them to do great things. I thank you, Lord God, and I praise you for all that you're going to do. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, amen. If you need prayer for anything, if you're struggling in your body, in your health, in your finances, in your relationship, and you need God to do something, I want to pray for you right now. Amen.